Greetings, friends. So I'm moving in the direction of increasingly doubting the existence of dinosaurs, but I'm open-minded. You can explain to me how I'm wrong. I'm not really committed to this one way or the other. I'm just moving in the direction of skepticism. But you can make a case for why all these fossils are authentic, and there really was this world of dinosaurs. But I'm looking at some of the examples of specimens and we have here Sue which is a nickname for one of the most complete and best preserved skeletons of Tyrannosaurus rex. They say that this specimen is 67 million years old. Now how they can know that that seems to me a very you know difficult task to ascertain but let's just put that aside for now. Sue was discovered some decades ago in the United States in South Dakota and as it turns out all Tyrannosaurus rex specimens have been discovered mostly in the Dakotas or Montana or around around that region of the United States and to an extent in Alberta, Canada and there are no other T-Rex specimens that I know of that are in any other part of the world. So how convenient for the institutions. These institutions are not only in the United States. They're in England, but, but it's just convenient. It's a convenient location to go and find these, uh, these specimens and then take them to the institution which believes in them. Now Sue was found buried on a exposed hillside or partially, I guess, the side of a hillside. They dug it out, and I haven't seen any photographs of what the dig site looked like. So again, you can redirect me to these things if I missed them. I just did some rudimentary perusing on the internet, like I did a few, you know, you know, the standard mainstream whatever comes up about it. That you know, I went to the Field Museum website where they, that's the museum that still houses the skeleton today. In any of these sources, there's n really nothing, like no photographs of any dig site or not in any detail. What did the bones look like coming out? Where's the matrix of the bones? And I'm not saying these documentations don't exist. I'm not saying that. I'm just expressing doubt that we're going to find good documentation of these things. Just like with other scientific things to do with space, when you actually look for photos, they're almost non-existent, at least on the internet. When you think if they want you to believe in these things, then they would make photographs more, more available. But I would be curious in knowing what did the bones really look like as they were coming out of the ground. They didn't have digital photography and like it was today. I, I get that, but but what about in the lab? What about all when once it once it came back? Couldn't we at least see what did the bones look like as they were coming together? And I am expressing a bit of doubt that all of the bones that they put in the skeleton are real. And they admit some of them are not real. That they highlight that some of them were made filled in on based on what they thought would be there. But 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 the thing about this skeleton is that it's supposed to be one of the most, one of the most complete because the, the T-Rex and, and dinosaurs in general, the skeletons are almost incomplete and, and, and often vastly un incomplete. And that's another reason to be skeptical because if empiricism is your basis, because science is empirical, to, to in a well, it, it must operate empirically, you're limited already by this lack of physical uh, completion in these skeletons and as we see in this other document here I went to this site uh, fossil wiki they have this image diagram showing found material in the forelimb elements from different specimens of t-rex now this must not be all the specimens because they said there were about more than 40 but I'm assuming that these are some of the notable ones because they're included here in this uh, sampling of 10. And if we have a closer look at this diagram, we can see some of them just have numbers and some of them have names. And so this is supposed to be the arms, right? Now, 
we can just get a sense for how in incomplete all these specimens are. And I guess the one that Sue was special for was for being uh, more more complete, as they say. We're, we just have to trust them. Maybe they're right. Actually, the one on the right is more complete, I'd say. UCRC. That one has more completion in, in the claws. But look at how, how uh, few the claws are. Of these 10 cases, only two of them have complete claws. And only one of them has sets of claws on both hands or whatever you would call that. Look in some of these other cases, they're just finding a single bone. Look at this one, RTMP 81.6.1. They just found like two little things. And then they inferred all the rest that it was part of that same animal. Maybe it was. Maybe it was. It should show you there's a lot of assumptions going on here. They're filling in a lot of gaps based on their own assumptions. One of the most interesting things about the skeleton of Sue is that the, the skull they have on display in the museum is not the actual skull. The actual skull is stored separately. For some reason, I did read something on Britannica.com. The dinosaur's 1.5 meter long skull was too heavy for the skeleton to support. So a life-size cast was made instead, and this was mounted to the rest of the skeleton, which features in the exhibit. And the actual skull was displayed elsewhere. Why? Would the skull be too heavy? I don't understand. I mean, I get that the skeleton is weak. It's their fossils, right? But surely everything is being supported with pieces of metal or pieces of support. Something to hold it together. Obviously, I don't think they're gluing the bones together, but they're doing something. They're probably using metal wires or, or something to keep this thing up. So if they can do that with the body, why can't they do that with the skull? It doesn't make any sense to me. If the animal's skull is too heavy now, wouldn't it be too heavy during its life? <laughs> uh, okay, let, let's grant there's some explanation for that. Then why can't they just find a way to get the skull up there? I mean, it's not like engineers can't figure out a way of doing that. And then when you look at photos of the actual skull, we see that it's not exactly like the thing that features in the actual exhibit. And looking at the skeleton itself, the full exhibit, something just doesn't look right to me. And again, this is my own, just my own opinion here, but the thing seems top heavy. It seems like it would topple over. How could an animal like this be so heavy? Its stomach is so big. It looks like they just blew up some little chicken to an immense size, an immense proportion. But they changed the head around. They changed the head of the chicken to something like a more nasty. I just don't understand how it could walk without falling over. So I looked up this video on YouTube called Sue T-Rex Talk at the Field Museum. And this is a talk given by Dr. Benjamin Zalisco, a scientist at the University of Chicago and docent at the Field Museum discussing this specimen of Sue. The only interesting part that I wanted to highlight here occurs when he was commenting on the uh, custody battle after this thing was discovered, contributing decisively to end this custody battle in the favor of the museum. Uh, listen to the following. She was claimed by four different groups. The Black Hills Institute that unearthed her, uh, the federal government under mineral mining rights, you can believe that, uh, the Sioux Indian Reservation, which also occupied the land, and the owner of the land, a rancher by the name of Maurice Williams. Now, uh, this ended up being raided by the FBI, years of litigation, so he was stored in a machine shop for several years, eventually given ownership to the landowner, Maurice Williams, and all he cared about was the money, So, which panicked a lot of people. So he put her up for auction in New York, she could go anywhere. She could go some rich guy as a part of their, their new kitchen, or it could have been bought by a museum, which is studied by the public and by scientists. Fortunately, uh, the Field Museum put together some money from a couple of small companies, uh, you may not have heard of, McDonald's and Disney, small, small little players, 
Bought for about $8 million, ultimately about a $20 million investment by the museum, opened here in 2000. It's enough about the, the fossil history. Let's talk biology of T-Rex, because I'm a biologist, that's what I'm going to do. So, uh... so how interesting. For one thing, he awkwardly says something that probably he thinks is funny because he said it to his people in the past a few times and he got a good reaction so now he says it to every group that comes to the museum he makes that quip about oh well some companies you haven't heard of and i i know how this works because i worked in museums too you have things that you say and you say them but also he's priming you to not make much of what he says in the next breath when when he says who these companies are mcdonald's and disney which is a very strange thing to say he's saying that these huge corporations big money corporations that and he was setting it up by the way that he was saying what a shame it would be if some guy with a lot of money a private uh, owner ended up with this fascinating skeleton as opposed to it ending up in a museum where the public can learn from it but then what ends up happening is big money corporations contribute to ensuring that it does end up in the museums and which corporations disney and, and mcdonald's both corporations which are involved in culture creation in america and beyond america explicitly disney but if you think about it mcdonald's too how many of our memories as children were affected by Disney and McDonald's. For me, maybe not Disney movies, but certainly McDonald's is something I remembered. It becomes part of the culture. Why were these corporations keen on making sure that the world's most complete uh, T-Rex skeleton got to see uh, you know, exposure to the public? Isn't that, I don't, I don't maybe it's, maybe that's, you know, not significant at all. But it is a little interesting, and then he says, "Well, you know, I'm not, I'm, a, I'm 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 not here to talk about that stuff. I'm here to be to talk about biology. That's my that's my deal." But but he's kind of almost frustratedly like casting that aside and and all the blind spots and and because that's as a scientist you have to consider the whole picture of how the context in which your specimens come to you. But well, I'm just a biologist. Let's forget about that. Now I can now I can focus on what they gave me. <laughs> so again, none of this dismisses Sue as a as a legitimate specimen. It just it just raises more questions though. So this is the best. This is the best that T-Rex specimens has to offer. And this one, maybe it's impressive, but if you saw holes and strange things in this specimen, like imagine all the other specimens. Hasta luego, amigos.